You guys are on the, like this was like the official panel. That's great. I like it. I had three boys here. I had your sons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I do the, well, I still teach full time, but I also do the archives. And that's where we collect stories and collect artifacts. And well, guys, let's kick it off. I, obviously, Cheryl introduced herself. I've met most of you now, and I'm Sean McMullen, your alumni director. And uh, we're going to start off a little bit with you guys telling us who you are, if you wouldn't mind. We'll start with you, Don. Don Mayer, class of 65, and as Tommy and I were talking, we went to Good Shepherd. I'm Terry Murphy, class of 61. Mike Boating, uh, class of 1960, but I also got to cash in on the faculty from 67 through 73. Uh, and Bob McDermott in class of 60. Uh, and I'm Joe Weaver, class of 1964. I'm Chris Bill Forty in the class of 68. And I'm Tom Hines, class of 1964. Welcome again. Uh, I was taking some notes while you boys were eating. A couple of really cool, interesting things y'all were kind of kicking around. And, and we're going to start with the most obvious. And it's uh, we've got a split decade here as far as Jesuit campuses go. And so I'm going to ask the guys in the 60, 61 era to start us off. I know our 64, 65 guys were in both campuses. How did it, how, what was the difference? What was it like to go to both campuses? Well, my group went two years. When we had our 50th, we thought that was kind of interesting having done two and two. Uh, one thing we all noted uh, is the, some of the traditions in the old school did not transfer over. The old school handball courts and some of the things that we did there, we had them here. They put them here, but it never quite worked out the same way. Um, I'm sure you guys were older. We did. There was a lot of times there was boxing in the basement of the old place at lunch. I can remember even a Jesuit, you know, uh, putting the gloves on. Yeah. John mentioned the the basement. Well, it was just a giant room, concrete or uh, brick walls and, and uh, very old and falling down everything was falling down uh, by the time we left and uh, you know we'd have a cold front and the wind would blow and we'd have to close the school because the there was so much cold air in. that that happened once or twice and uh, so moving out here was just uh, it uh, wasn't air conditioned yet but I mean we were we were walking into the Taj Mahal compared to uh, what we had before my take on Jesuit coming here and as a freshman at the end of 64 and graduating in 68 this place was like it was like Hollywood it was bright and shiny and new uh, they had a track out there that wasn't cinder uh, it was synthetic and it was the talk of the town among high school athletes um, because it was spongy when you ran on it it, it had some give, and it wasn't so hard on your knees. But I remember coming and going through orientation um, from grade school. I went to St. Monica's and grew up in North Dallas. And coming out here was just like, wow, this, is, this place is just fabulous. And you could look out the cafeteria windows. I don't believe Hager Stadium had yet been built. Okay. The track was there, and you could see way down past Forest Lane. So it was kind of at the edge of the city, uh, as I remember it as a young kid coming out here. And it was, you know, it was great, nice, clean classrooms and lockers in the halls, all the stuff that you'd always thought a high school would be like. And I was very impressed by it. Where were most of you living? Where, what areas of town were you coming from? Oak Cliff, Oak Cliff, okay. Oak Cliff, 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 to Garland here. Which, if, if you said this was the edge of the city, well, Garland was off the edge. <laughs> well, you know, that's true. I would leave here, even as a senior in 65, after baseball practice, and I would drive out um, toward uh, uh, the mall now. There was nothing here, and I turned right, and it was Valley View Lane, and it was winding horse farms. We thought it was, I thought it was great. We all did coming out here, but all of us in our 50th agreed that there was there was also a certain part lost when you lost the old school because you could not bring all the old traditions that were there. Sure. I mean, yeah, uh, and one of those traditions that was lost in coming from the old school to here was the one that was developing where the seniors were able to go out on the uh, 
parking lot and find a bug and drag it down and put it in the basement. Yeah. A, a Volkswagen or a Volkswagen bug. Oh, Volkswagen. No, he's, he's, he's not talking about it. He's talking about the real thing. They'd take it down <laughs> into the old basement, and Father Revoir would go to banana. Well, we gained a football stadium moving out here. We didn't have one back at the old Jets. We played yeah, no gym either. Fourth four, fourth four. Was fourth four was condemned. Was condemned yeah, so. that's right. I believe it was condemned. Wait a minute. Four, the gym was, was condemned. No, well, yeah, but we still play. Play. Had, we had we, intramurals, we but you had no time. varsity games. When was it condemned? Brender, Brender has lots of stories about it being condemned. Yeah, but they played intramural basketball, well, played all of that stuff. They may have played anyway. anyway. But, but all the basketball games, you're right, were away games. Yeah. There were no so home, home anything. Interesting. Now, we have a new addition. Would you say your name in your class year for us? Uh, Bob Hendler, 1966, and I'm trying to see if I'm supposed to recognize anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Bob. We're glad you're here. I was going to tell you, uh, so I was in the last class in the old building, and you could have 10 people play basketball on the fourth floor and no more because it was, but 10 could go up there and play. And you'd watch the pigeons fly around as you played basketball. But after we came over here, and I can't ever remember whether it was my second or third year, we walked into the old auditorium, horseshoe auditorium, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a door that went out to the parking lot, and then it was straight across rows of seats, and we had morning report, and Father of War walks in, and there's a Volkswagen sitting in the middle <coughs> of what was the stage in those days, and Father of War doesn't say a word. He ignores it, he does morning report, he finishes it up, and then he says, Dismissed, and then he does a pause as he would do. And he said, And the football team will remain behind. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's a calmer father of more than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about discipline. You've all kind of touched on it a little bit. What was, uh, talk about Penance Hall, or what was it like? Who was who were the hard ones, or who gave the most PHs? Well, Father Revoir was the one who sent you there and controlled it. So, my senior year, uh, I was in 4101, right across from the principal's office. And he got on the squawk box and he was really mad. And he ranting and raving and going on. And I made some wise ass comment. And Mr. Cousins said, Come up here. I said, No, I'll walk over. He said, Come up here. So he writes out a note, he says, Take this to Father of War. I'm walking down the hall and I said, My life is over. <laughs> and he was still mad and I, so I knock on the door. What do you want? I said, Father. <laughs> I have a note for you. And he opens up, he says, Get out! And I said, Well, am I supposed to get out? Well, so I'm supposed to go home. Get out of here. So I go home, my mother said, What happened? I said, You don't want to know. <laughs> but he got over about three o'clock. He calls up and says, Marge, you can send him back home. I mean send him back to school tomorrow. Uh, but he's gonna be a penance hall. And he had all kinds of different things. One of the ones was you had to write 13 million, you did subtract seven. And then whatever that is, you subtract seven from that, and then seven from that. So I spent a lot of time in there. Or trace of paper clip. A paper clip. Trace of paper clip. Paper clip. I mean, I spent, my mother says, I don't care how long you spend on pencil, just graduate, please. <laughs> Bob, Mike, well, tell us a little <clears> bit about. Uh, we had a group in St. Monica's, because I graduated from St. Monica's, and it was a carpool. Mike Bolger was the driver, and uh, the, what we did in, in, that, in, the, in the car was was a whole other story because we would, you know, be throwing eggs at each other as we're leaving the campus, or we're going to get you tomorrow. But uh, but we were victims. Of <laughs> Mike, you guys were a year ahead of us, Mike Bolger, because uh -huh. um, I had a car last couple of years, a '54 Green Chevy. We call it the Green Goose. And I pick up Mike Lindley and Tommy Maluli and Paul Kaiser. And after I pick up Maluli, down over on Gooding, we'd see the first time we saw uh, Bulger come around the corner and you guys egged us. Well, then the, the fight was on, so we loaded up. Everyone had to steal a couple of eggs. So every morning, back and forth. We were the first victim because you, you guys started. <laughs> Way to go, Bob. Yeah, yeah right, right. The idea was maybe to leave the eggs out a couple of days and <coughs> that made me a little spinky, but uh, that would be a good one. <coughs> the other thing that the old, the old school had was the, there was no, uh, all the games were played at Highland. I was lucky enough to play some football and, uh, and uh, 
we played the home games in Holland, so all we have is this, this field. <laughs> And we'd roll around and tackle and, and practice out there, and there'd be stickers all over your uniform just because they didn't do anything to maintain the, the uh, ground. It was just part of the rock. Mike, I'm going to start with you on something. Tell me about the uniform requirements. The uniform requirements. Yeah. What did, what were you? What did you have to wear? What was standard for everybody? Were there clothes? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a, that's a good start. <laughs> Terry, I appreciate that. We did wear shirt and tie. Okay. Um, no, we didn't. <laughs> we didn't wear ties, just khakis and white shirts, usually. Yeah, the ties didn't start. Well, I might have that confused with we did, when we, we No, we didn't here. have coats or ties. You can wear whatever you wanted. Well, I mean, your memory is much better than mine. Well, when I started well, in 16, I wouldn't want you had to wear <laughs> clip on ties, black pants, white shirt. And then when it, in October, November, the blazer, we had the green blazer, green blazers, with the yeah. yellow, right. you know, deal, and you got everything. Maybe that started here. Maybe that actually no, started, it started here. before no, that. It did. Sixty-one. I, I was a freshman in sixty-one, and yeah. that was the it first. Started year at the old school. Yeah. yeah. But when we were freshmen, didn't didn't we wear beans? Yes, we yeah. had to wear beans. Yeah, we had a bean. But in the in the seniors, if you didn't wear one, would give you a hard time. But then. After a couple of months, nobody cared. I mean, it always got me the black <laughs> clip-on tie. Never, yeah, I had a clip-on yeah, tie. Yeah, I don't know why they had. It had to be a clip-on. I don't know if they did. They thought guys would strangle each other. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. Probably <laughs> Somewhere between 62 and 66, one year, maybe with the Beatles, we had navy jackets. There you go. Yeah, my no brother. Collar, no collar. You mentioned Correct. that. I think you're no right. No collar. Interesting. Yes. My brother, Dan, reminded me of that. Huh. Amazing. What, what were you guys into? What was your, uh, Mike, I know you were a basketball player and, you know, ended up being a coach for Jesuit for a long time. What did you all participate in? Well, we had the, I guess you would call the main uh, athletic teams, uh, football, uh, basketball, baseball, track. Um, we kind of had a golf team. We had, we had a uh, interesting it was alluded to earlier when the, the football team, Bob was talking about the football team, played all their home games at, at Highland, Highlander Stadium. Uh, and because uh, there was no, there was no f football field to, to right. well, I guess the, though the B team and the freshmen sometimes would play on the upper field. Everybody who went to the old school knows what the, bottom, the uh, lower field was. But we also played baseball. Yeah, yeah, we also played right. baseball. Yeah, but the, the thrill of playing baseball down there was you had to know where the holes were in the outfield so you could run around them. Uh, just, and it's kind of interesting to watch guys from other schools when they hit those, they hit one of those holes and they go down and they're finished. We won a lot of games that year. Yes. <laughs> Another team couldn't finish. Uh, the, uh, Father Bay was <clears throat> the athletic director and uh, to say anything, he was very frugal uh, <laughs> and um, I can't let this opportunity go, but the class of uh, 60 or the football class of uh, 59 was the only undefeated and untied uh, football uh, team. And uh, at the end of the season, uh, Coach Godet said, well, uh, since we did so good, uh, everybody gets to keep their jersey. And Father May went, oh, you keep the mark? What, what are you going to do next year? Because we don't have any reserve uh, jerseys. They, they were all sewed up, and, you know, every time there was a rip, somebody would sew it up. And in baseball, Father May comes up with this great idea that he is going to, I don't know who sold him this idea, but he came up with the idea that he could buy major league baseball bats that had been broken. <laughs> and it came in a, and it came in this supply with uh, nails and a uh, <laughs> tape that you could put around it. So he goes out and he buys this, and in come these broken bats. And he takes out his hammer and he's driving his little nails in there, and then he's wrapping it up and get, gives them to us. Says, "Okay, boys, go get them." <laughs> they didn't work at all. <laughs> Not at all. But that was Father May, always trying to save money somehow, somewhere. What a great guy he was. Really was. Uh, Arthur Allen, who was one of our first black students, uh, was on the team. He was a very good halfback. 
And uh, so we couldn't play the Dallas teams uh, in football because at the time they weren't allowing black players. So we went to Wilmer Hutchins, we went to Terrell, we went to Kaufman, we went to other cities and whatever. But I remember distinctly that we were on a bus and we were going to some city and uh, we stopped to eat. We came in and uh, the guy came over and said, well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this uh, young man here needs to go back in the kitchen and eat. That he came eat there with you guys. And so the coach says, okay, thank you very much. And we just got up and walked out. So we all learned a lesson from that, obviously. And uh, it, it, it was a, obviously a different time, but uh, uh, I think it, 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 at that time of our lives, we saw what was really important. Was uh, that Coach Godet? It was Coach Godet, and Coach Gerrick was with us at the time. Coach Godet was from New Orleans. Yeah. Okay. I, I had a null athletic career. Uh, I didn't play anything because I wasn't good enough. Um, I, my dad wanted me to play sports, and I said, I don't play. He said, okay, you're not an athlete, but you're an athletic supporter. So I became a cheerleader by acclamation, and because I wanted to be on the same field as my, my heroes here. Okay. We have, we have Would you band. introduce yourself, say your class year for us? Uh, Rudy Tovar, uh, class of 64. Good to have you, Rudy. Uh, I was in the band, you know, while I was here. I have a little band story of sorts. Not so much relative to uh, something that happened here, but something that happened much later. So, like a lot of people that came here, it was expensive. It wasn't really expensive, it, but if you have no money, you have no money. But I remember throwing a paper wrap to go here, and the tuition for the whole year was $290. So if I could make $50 a month, you know, that I could give $29 towards tuition. And so I saved them the rest of my money to uh, buy a clarinet to play in the band. And somewhere around my sophomore or junior year, it was gone. You know, I uh, didn't know whether I had lost it or, or whatever. Uh, from there, I went on to Spring Hill. I went on to medical school. I went on to residency. I came back to Dallas in 1977. And I get this little uh, note uh, in my mailbox, it says, I am the student that stole your clarinet. <laughs> Here is a hundred dollars. I have thought about it all these years. I uh, have been upset about it. If this is, I'm sorry if it's not enough, but this is all I have right now. It was just a hundred dollar bill. Wow. And this is, uh, what, 15, 20 years later. I, I, I think that's a testimony to the type of person that, you know, came here. You know, they have a sense of God and sense of what's right. You know, and I, I I still have a little note in my house, you know. It's, uh... And then the only other story I want to tell you is I don't know if any of you remember Otis, Otis the horse. We had a mascot in this. Uh, and the guy somehow got this horse for us, and then he would borrow the SMU mascot cart, hook it up behind his car, and he would drive this, this horse. It was meaner than hell. It was a miniature to all these games. And he and I would drive the horse. He was a cheerleader. So anyway, we're, we're heading, so we're with, does anybody remember Father McGranahan? But anyway, McGranahan and Hirsch and I are going down to Waco, I guess on a Friday night. And we're going along 60 miles down the highway, and all of a sudden, there's lights, flashing lights. And I go on, I get out, and there's a barrier across the highway, and about 10 police cars. And we suddenly realized we were driving to Waco the Friday night before the Baylor SMU game in Dallas with the SMU mascot, it says SMU Peruna, heading to Waco. And the police went, ah, we've got these kids. So now we're toast. And the granddad gets out and pulls out something that shows he's a Jesuit. I don't know what he had. He pulled out. He said, no, 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 I'm a Jesuit. Let me explain. That's the only reason he didn't all go to prison. You know? <laughs> uh, we went down and bought a bag and we would give them. Give them. But we could take it down when they weren't using it. So they would lend us that. True story. I've heard about Otis. I didn't realize. So it was a miniature horse. Miniature horse, one year. We used him for one year and gave it up. We would, we would, I know this is for posterity. We would go to the other side of the field when he had to eliminate his uh, lab. The thing that I really wanted to talk about as it related to athletics where there were two very formative things that happened. Uh, one was when I was a freshman, and you come to school here, 
and Father Revore would have you go to the pep rallies on Friday before the ball game. And it didn't matter whether they were away or at home, there was a pep rally every Friday. And it was wonderful. Passway would come in and talk, and you know, everybody would get all fired up. And they get you bought ribbons for the week uh, that you were playing McKinney or Corsicana or whoever it was. And there was a certain amount of festiveness to the idea. And, you know, you're looking at this and going, my God, these guys really are, this is a big deal. So we play through the season, and we're going to play in the state championship at St. Thomas in Houston. And they get their butts kicked. We lose. And, I mean, it was really traumatic. At least it was to me as a freshman. Because I thought those guys were invincible, and we got beat. So we go through three more years of this, and my class comes along. We haven't won a state championship, and lo and behold, we end up on Friday night, a state championship game at Hager Stadium between St. Thomas, those guys who were freshmen watching the ball game when we were freshmen, and my class, they're both on the field playing. St. Thomas, I think we were down 21 to nothing at half, at the half, and in the third day, our guys came back and rallied back. It was one of the most uplifting things I've ever been associated with. I mean, it was, it was what high school football was all about. On top of that, we had six high school All-Americans on that team. So I believe it's your brother. Charlie was on there. Uh, Charlie Hendler was on there. Uh, oh, goodness. I'll tell you who they are. Bill Walker, Paul Ellis, Tommy Klein, Mike Neitzel. Um, those were the guys that were the All-Americans. And there was a certain pride on the part of our class that we had gotten to that level with those kids. All those guys that were, that was my first year of teaching. That was your first year of teaching? I taught them everything. <laughs> did you, you did a good job. But not everything you know. The, the other thing, and I guess as we got older, we tended to share more. I guess we grew up getting a little more mature, but we tended to share in the successes of our classmates. And we had graduated, we'd gone through graduation, and we had kids from our class, Larry Ackles and Mike Fernandez, that went to the Nationals in the National Debate Championship and won it. And I, it, that was, I remember because the yearbooks were printed and we'd already we'd done all we could do, but we came back well after we had graduated to get them. And it was a big deal that they had won the Nationals. We were all very, very pleased about that for them. So, I mean, you know, I, I think as we got older and mature, we tended to share in some of the victories that our class had. It was a good thing. Started that we have a really good debate team now, and I know the history was all the way. Uh, we've had a lot of really great Advocates. It goes to 64 at least. I'm sure it goes back further. Oh, sure. It's amazing. I got now, it. what were you going to say? Since Father May was so frugal, uh, our practice uniforms were unbelievable. There was no matching. You had, some people had yellow, some people had white, some people had orange uh, 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 pants. Your shirts were whatever they were, and they were just all colored, and, and the helmets were <laughs> just about as bad. And we had a, a, a scrimmage once with Thomas Jefferson. Of the year, our senior year. Thomas Jefferson was a brand new school, it was on Walnut Hill, nothing north of there but cornfields, and it was a beautiful school. And we drive up in the Blue Goose, which was the name of the school bus, and we come piling out <laughs> with these Notre Dame used uniforms and everything else. And over at the other end is this perfectly white. You know, they had complete white uniforms, they had names on their backs, uh, red colors here, just everything was matching. <laughs> and uh, they started laughing at us. And so we said, well, okay, let that happen. So needless to say, it was a great ride home because we whooped them at the scrimmage. Right. <laughs> in fact, uh, in fact that we uh, had uh, the, the, right. the uniforms so bad. Sure. Do you remember what the band uniforms looked like then? They were those blue Bolshevik They're looking. Quite attractive. Uh, quite uh, attractive. As the guys, they, they did look like something like out of World War II. And, <laughs> you know, and, uh, Army now tell me about the, you know, we're good Jesuit boys. We're maybe studying a little bit. We're pulling some pranks. Let's talk about some girls. Uh, you mentioned a couple of girls' schools. 
What was homecoming, prom? What were those like in your Jesuit experience? Well, I, I was a great disappointment to uh, most women, except for my wife. We just, <laughs> we've been married 50 years. And even there. <laughs> even there had been a great disappointment, but what's she going to do? We've been married 50 years. So I only had one girlfriend. The, uh, the schools that we dated were Ursuline, and we used to go over to Ursuline. Uh, if we had cars, we'd drive by and go out front, and you know they'd come out and talk. Uh, and LGC, I dated a girl from LGC. And that stands for? A Lady right. Good Council, it was yeah. Oak Cliff. Yeah. Well, you know, at that time when they had homecoming, they would have four queens and four kings, yeah. St. Edward, St. Anne's, LGC, yeah. and Ursuline. Oh, yeah. And then they would true. pick four guys from uh, one of the classes to export them out, so it was always four kings and four queens. Did y'all rent out hotels, or where were the was these were these on campus? These we were good Catholic boys. We didn't rent. Oh, out. Like, well, our, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me home, rephrase. The, the, the they actually had a homecoming in the basement. Yeah, the yeah, basement. yeah. 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 It was at the school. Yeah. Oh, okay. And look at homecoming in here. That will really turn. We did. We did. We the girls had to go to the ladies' room. As I remember, they they had, I guess, cleaned. I'm sure they cleaned one of the Johns. And I remember the one you floor, couldn't the, clean the mothers, jobs. the mother, some mothers would be there. You stayed. They escorted the girls down, and I can only imagine the horrors, you know, of what they saw in those bathrooms. Maybe that's why I didn't have any second dates. I don't know, but, but I always remember, I always remember that, you know. But everything was in there. It was in there. Only thing I there they are in there. It, that's in the basement. And oh, look, interesting. they took a little crepe paper and put oh, it around yeah, a couple around of those columns. You couldn't dress that pig up. I mean, it was just fun. <laughs> and the Mother's Club did this? Yeah. I don't know. Who, I don't know. Who, but the mothers would, there would be mothers when you, your girlfriend had to go. You couldn't go up there. And I always wondered what they did to those Johns, because you're right, man. That there was, was no way. That would have been like going to a war zone. You know? <laughs> Terrible. What was the Jesuit influence? Where, where is it 100% Jesuit run faculty? Yeah. When y'all were Jesuit? No, we had, we probably had, I would say, you can look in the yearbook, but I bet we had six or seven that weren't Jesuits, but we were filled with Jesuit scholastics. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And they were great. We had a guy, and they would be your homeroom uh, teacher. When I was a freshman, we had Mr. Seitz, Vincent Seitz, who was a world-class swimmer and world-class athlete, and he was really good with us. If you misbehaved, Rather than call you out, he'd just come down and he'd lean down to your desk and you respected him so much. He'd just say a few words and you'd obey. And he would have um, nights, like on a Friday night, um, a class night or something, we'd meet in the old gym and he'd play games like, you know, capture the phone. And uh, we had Mr. Wren. So we had tons of these scholastics. Yeah, we had, I'd say, more than half the faculty would do the scholastics or Jesuits. And you had them for, for everything. And you're right; some of them were tremendous athletes. They would play basketball with you. I mean, and they would be willing to mix it up. But there was one that uh, my junior senior and I and I had him my my junior year it was Mr. Young, J U N G, and yeah. and he died in the middle of uh, my he had a heart problem. Probably something that now you know could be taken care of. But he was just the most extraordinary English teacher, and he loved poetry. And he knew, I think it was Emily Dickinson, but all of her stuff by heart. But so much we would be, you know, while we're reading in the book, he doesn't even use it. He just is reciting it, and he was just utterly brilliant. But we had a class night, like you were talking about, and he wasn't that much of an athlete, but there were several of the Jesuits there. And I'll never forget, we called him Little Albie behind us. He was just maybe five foot two. And he sunk a long three-pointer, and he said, that's it. Going. And we came to school the Monday, and he had died over the weekend with, a, you know, with this problem with his heart. He was only like 26 or 7. Most brilliant intellect ever been around. And when I went to college and they had my English, I took poetry because I remembered just what that man did. And all my life, I, I still think of him. He signed my yearbook. Uh, congratulations, Hines, on four years of irreligious experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had they had good senses of humor. Oh, oh, God. Mr. Yeah. Jung had a great oh, sense of humor, particularly. He <laughs> would uh, he's uh, was brilliant and inspiring uh, as you're describing. But but he would also he had a had a tendency to to engage oh. us and uh, and laugh with us. And the the class would get a little bit too raucous, and then he would. He would have to explode and stop us. 
but he was just a an absolute delight. The individual who uh, Terry mentioned was Ben Wren, who was a Jesuit scholastic. And he was my freshman, uh, uh, yeah, uh, home, homeroom teacher. And one day comes in and he walks over and he closes the door and he says, put the windows down, everybody put some windows down. And he says, all right, everybody come gather around. And no one knows what's going on, and everybody goes up, and gathers around uh, Mr. Wren, and he says, "All right, class 102 is having a class night on Friday night, and we're going to rate it." <laughs> so he begins the plan rating to other classes, home, home classes, tonight. and that's the way Ben. Wren, I mean, he was, you know, he was, he just always doing things like that. He's a tremendous individual. Yeah, he and he and Sykes were good buddies, so it was all, always a rival, rival with every class. Like if you had to sell subscriptions or whatever, whatever event you were doing to raise money for whatever. And it was, but he always wanted to get Ren, and Ren always wanted to get Sykes because they were both <laughs> really hail fellows, well met. The other thing I'd say about uh, the Jesuits, especially the Scholastic, is they took a real interest in you. They loved the kids. Uh, and and we looked up to them. They taught us stuff. They taught us how to, you know, how to discuss and how to do this, that, and the other thing. And uh, uh, I missed that uh, when I went to college because college is different. You don't expect that kind of stuff. But I think the education I got in that old crappy building that was falling apart was the best education I got. I have a feeling that there was also a life of the scholastics that we never saw. And so Pat Hunter was uh, was our home teacher in. Two, and just one day, you know, I just, I just, he, he was always, he would play with us in the afternoon, he'd be going, anyway, I asked him, I said, well, how much do you sleep at night? He says, three to four hours a night. And I said, well, why? He says, uh, and he told me, he said, I got this work to do, and I got, this, I got you, and I have to prepare this, and I'm out doing ministry work, and, you know, working around town. And I, I just wonder how many of the scholastics did the same thing we never did. Yeah, we took it for granted that we were their sole focus. Now you mentioned homerooms. I'm going to ask Joe a question because you and I spoke at a, uh, this weekend about something. Tell me about the sections. So you took all your classes with the same group of guys. Uh, it, it isn't like uh, when my kids were here, uh, you, you moved to, you, you may have an honors, honors English, but then you have regular math and regular science. Or it, you, you had all, all your classes with the same group. But you, you interacted through activities, band, uh, or cheerleading, or athletics, or wh whatever you happen to participate in. And, and then, like now, uh, guys participated. In senior, in senior year, junior and senior year, I was in the honor class, but father, and the teachers would come to you. So you just sat in your class, you had your oh, wow. chair, and they would come to you, but not Father May. We had to for Bro, no. where his lab was. You had to go to the physics lab. Yeah, well, he wasn't he smoking in the lab. He was smoking up there. No, no, I know that. But the lab was a separate room from the classroom. Right, but he'd go in the lab to smoke. Yeah, he'd go in the radio See, room so and while smoke. You were, while you were walking up to his class, he was in the lab. Ah, oh, that's it. I thought that's that was it. sulfur dioxide. <laughs> no. was so what we smoke? had to do is, in junior year for chemistry, we had to pick up and go up to Father May's room. Right. And then uh, for physics in senior year. Other than that, you just stayed in the room. The teachers had to walk around. Gotcha. The system had its pluses and minuses. You're with the same 30 people or 25 people, I think, we right. ended up with all the time. So on the one hand, you got to take classes with people who were more or less at the same speed as you. But on the other hand, you were cloistered from the other guys in the class. So I didn't get to know very well other guys in our class of 64 until actually we started preparing for the reunion. Right. I mean, that's a long time to wow. go without really knowing well the other guys. And and I'll tell you, you know, that, that made it even better, though. When we got to our reunion, it, it was just wonderful. <coughs> it felt like you had made 100 new friends. Tommy, that's interesting because I started here in your 50th, class of 64, and I was amazed at how many guys are introducing themselves to guys that they had the same class year. As we listen to your stories, Jesuit's important to all of you. I'd like to hear why. Uh, why would? You, what, what about Jesuit to this day? What does Jesuit mean to you? So uh, my mother was Boston, 
Roman Catholic. My father was a Grand Knight of the Knights of Columbus. My father was from Temple, Texas, and Jewish. She wanted to send me here. He objected vociferously because they were going to take me and turn me into a priest. <laughs> uh, Al Hammer ended up being as president of the Parents Club, uh, one of his third or fourth year. So, and also put up with Otis the Horse, which was a big deal. <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 it reaches out beyond those two gentlemen, you know, and uh, uh, he eventually converted. Uh, to me, it was the formative time of my life, and, and for others, has been the way it's been ever since. I would say that uh, same thing. I got four years of Jesuit uh, high school, and then I went to four years of Oyo University in uh, New Orleans. So I had eight years of Jesuit uh, training, uh, which was in what I consider the, my formation time. And uh, uh, one of the things, in simple words, that uh, I think the school, because I know I took Latin for two years, but I don't remember anything but Terra and Terra. But, uh, <laughs> you, you, you learn. You learn to learn. So when you get out in professional life or in later life, you can tackle the problems and you can sit back and figure out what needs to be done to move forward. And, and I, I was lucky enough to get eight years. Of it. I would have to say the same thing as the two of them. I mean, that the concept of men for others. Uh, I did, you know, four years here and the four years of Spring Hill. And uh, med school and residency was kind of something else, but once you got into private practice, that concept, okay, well, so you have patients that can pay and you have patients that can't pay. Uh, so I was the one that set up the energy clinic, set up this, set up that, and I said, well, why are you doing that? This, that's what you do. Somebody's got to take care of them. They, they can't just drop into the hospital, you know, without care. It all stemmed back from that, you know, well, you got to take care of somebody else. You were the else. outlier. You were the outlier. Exactly. I'm always proud to say I went to Jesuit. Whenever anybody talks about school, I always say I went to Jesuit. And by the way, I went to Jesuit High School, not Jesuit prep. So downtown, where men were men back in the old days. But I was always proud. Um, good old days. But it was always part of our family. My, my dad, who died when I was young, but he went to uh, Saint Ignatius and John Carroll, both uh, Jesuit schools. Um, I have a grandson here, uh, Kevin Walker, who's a junior. So it's just part of our family tradition, something I'm proud of, and, like I said before, the best education in terms of uh, pound for pound for what you're supposed to get in high school was the best education I got. I think for me, it was, to, to take off on what you said, it was one-stop shopping for a terrific high school experience. You had athletics that were great, you had social that was great, and you had an educational experience that just couldn't be matched. For me, the one word that describes it is intensity. It was extremely intense. I thought I was a good student. I thought I could do well. But I'll tell you, the experience when I got here was kind of like, welcome to the NFL. And it pulled me along in its way. The people, the, the teachers, and my fellow students, too, pulled me along so that I was able to do better. And it prepared me, not just for college, but for life. And that's why I love it so much. My situation was a, a, a very similar in terms of the feelings, but my, my dad was raised in an orphanage and quit high school after the 10th grade. My mom was from southern Ohio in Appalachia, and she quit the school after the 10th grade to live with her sister. So when they moved down here, they joined 799 to Knights of Columbus, and my dad started hearing about Jesuit from the guys that were going there. And he decided this is where I was going to go. And I, they sent four boys here, my son went here, and it's like you said, it is one shop stopping. The traditional values that you learn here, uh, the rest of it, it's like a foundation that the rest of your life just lays upon, at least for me. And you can't go wrong when you lean back at tough times on what you learned here. And I bless my parents every day for sending me here. To me, the importance was or the significance was going through experiences with guys who whose parents have put them in a position to um, to grow and thrive where the Ignatian values and dis or Ignatian discipline and approach is part of the uh, 
part of the experience and and the Christian values are paramount, the men for others, they call it, and you're, you're doing the, the intense studies, the intense athletics, you've experienced um, wonderful things and wonderful growth together, and, and that forms a bond that, that lasts a lifetime, I think. I think you walk in here, a young kid, and you walk out of here a young man. Um, I think the process that the Jesuits have used over the years, <clears throat> combined with the quality of the people who were here, is what sets this institution apart from every place else I've ever been. And you took pride in the work that you did, whether you were in the Philothespic or putting the yearbook together or writing the roundup or whatever it was that you did, debating or whatever. I've sent three boys through here, and I think it is the, one of the best things I've ever been able to do for my children and my family. Joe's right, uh, they, they get formed here. There's a certain formation that takes place, and it leaves an indelible mark on them. And they're all proud. When you ask them where they went to school, they don't tell you it's Tech or TCU or Oklahoma or wherever they went to school. They always start with Jesuit. What a great place to see him, the young man. I've had a son who graduated from here. Uh, I have a grandson who will be graduating from here next year. Um, but when it comes down to it, there's just something special. It's hard to put your finger on. Uh, but I sit here, I've known Bob since we were a freshman at Jesuit. Mr. Murphy, you know, known him, same thing. Uh, the men that I met here who were our teachers, our mentors, all special. And I think the uh, thing that, that says it the most for me, and, and I'd also say I, I've been very privileged to be able to stay involved in Jesuit in a number of different ways because I need to give back what it had given but I think the thing that says it more than anything else is that in my lifetime, I've had three very deep friends, not just acquaintances, not just people I went to school with, but very deep friends. Well, I went to school with all of them. Yeah. And that's, it's special. I want to formally close with y'all and just say thank you from the Alumni Association, from Cheryl and Archives, Mr. Ersing, and 75 years of Jesuit history. Y'all just opened up the timeline for the 60s and it really filled a lot of gaps for us. So please, from the bottom of our hearts, know thank you.